have been um, taken out of the home for child abuse neglect. Um, and April is Child Abuse Prevention Awareness Month, so we are running a campaign. The campaign is sort of similar to the Ice Bucket Challenge, if any of you are familiar with social media. So we are having people paint their one fingernail blue, and we're asking them to hashtag post their pictures online and hashtag the manicure movement, as well as polishing off child abuse. This is a national initiative that was started through Embrace Families um, out of Central Florida. And we are handing out a brochure to the people that are getting their fingernail painted. And the brochure talks about the movement. So one, we ask you to paint one fingernail because one in five children will experience abuse by the age of 18. And five children die every day as a result of child abuse. As well as it only takes one person to make a difference. So it's a conversation starter, it's to bring awareness, and our agency is the agency that handles these things in Charlotte County. We also have a mentoring program that we would say if anybody wanted to help, this is a year-round way to help families. These are for families that are already reunified and have their children in their home, helps them keep their children in their home. So I just wanted to make everybody aware of the manicure movement, and we will have a desk set up outside and you may see it in other places in the community so that you can get your fingernail painted. Not easier than an ice bucket. <laughs> yes, much easier. <laughs> All right, does anyone have any questions? Let's get into dialogue, but thank you oh, very much. Thank you. you have a nice day. Yes, we will. All right, thank <clears throat> you. Very good. Again, this is citizen input, any county related subject. Anyone wishing to address the board, please step forward. Come forward, sir. Bringing an adorable youngster like that in this chamber might be considered child abuse. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for what all y'all do. I'm new to this area. I've been here for about a year and a half now, and I'm from Tennessee. My name is William Charles Traywick, Jr., and I'm, I'm here today because of reflections like this right here. It's my granddaughter, but I live on uh, 9177 Fruitland Avenue on, in Inglewood. And I have some dire concerns over children's safety and adult safety on that road. I didn't know that when I moved there how dangerous it really was. And what I mean by that is there's a 30 mile speed limit right now and we've asked and we've got some results on some issues that have come up already. And what I mean by that is they put a, a traffic flashing light there telling you when you're exceeding the speed limit and then started today, they're actually putting a red light in at Winchester Road, which I've seen deaths in a year and a half, six, at that intersection. And my major concern is, is there's no place, I'm in between an element, two elementary schools and a high school, and there's a lot of traffic, foot traffic, and bicycle traffic, and elders that walk, walk that road. And my concern is, is the safety I'm, speeding is a big concern to me, but I work with the Sheriff's Department a lot and saying thank you guys for coming down there and supporting us on this road. But the main thing is the safety of the, of the people of the, of the road and the people that live there. And if you would, just take in that consideration of the humanity of it. And I thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Again, this is Citizen Input, any county related subject. Is there anyone else who would like to step forward? Good afternoon. Commissioners. Commissioners, Joan Fisher again. Uh, I do have some comments on what happened this morning. I thought it was a terrible thing going on about the uh, shelter, the hurricane shelter. And I believe that you supported by using that letter and sending it off and by not voting against uh, what as uh, Representative Grant suggested that if he got three votes, he would pull it. Uh, by not doing that, I really think that it was, uh, there was something going on that was wrong. I'd like you to know what happened out in the hallway later on. People outside, they were talking about this. They were upset too. And many of them, many of them said that, uh, what's in it for you? 
they're all asking what's in it for you because they feel there's something going on. They thought there's something going on monetarily. This is what they were saying. So this is the impression that you gave. Uh, I don't think your actions represent the people of Charlotte County. And you know, this morning I alluded to the Wizard of Oz and the, the Yellow Brick Road, et cetera. Well, I'm beginning to think this is Oz because you're not involving the people in that. And we are worried about hurricanes and such, but we want meetings to discuss it. We want to find out where are the levels, the uh, uh, zones where the ground is higher. There are others that are higher. There are counties we can work with here that might have higher ground, like Sarasota does, and they would be closer and more easily uh, accessible as hurricane shelters. So, uh, but I think that was really important as to what was being said outside, that that's the impression the people got from today, that there's something going on that uh, you, it was a failure today, that you failed today by not sending that letter, by not getting three votes to say, okay, pull that, and we're going to start all over again. Commissioner Doherty, you already said that there were a thousand steps before this can happen. Well, we want to go back to step one, and we want to find out what we can do to protect the people in Charlotte County. And I wish they would take all of those uh, weather reports off TV. They stimulate this terribly. They tell people, and then uh, they start two and three weeks ahead of time, and people don't know what to do by the time the hurricane gets here. Uh, okay, and again, I just want to say, you could have voted against that this morning. You could have just said, let's cancel it, get three votes, cancel that, and we will start again, and we will be in charge of it, and not either Tallahassee or Kitson down in Babcock Ranch and anybody who's working for him and who's probably involved in this as well. That was my first guess. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Again, citizen input, any county-related subject. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone, last call, is there anyone else? Okay, I see no one else stepping forward, commissioners. We're gonna go to, uh, that's all right, we're gonna go to comments. And I'm gonna start with Ray. Thank you. Uh, County Administrator. <clears throat> I just had one item today, commissioners. Uh, I wanted to bring up for discussion uh, the old Punta Gorda Library. Uh, Kelly Shoemaker had given a presentation, it's probably been <coughs> a month at least. Uh, and the outcome from that was to have our community services staff work with some of the historical groups to see if we could use that facility partnering with them. That day we also had another uh, possibility or option and it was for us to uh, or the board to consider offering that property to the city of Punta Gorda. And the more I thought about it, we, by the way, we have continued the work of, you know, looking to set meetings with the historical groups. And if that's your direction, we'll continue to go there. But by offering the property to this city, it would, it would serve those people from the city that elected officials and some of the historical groups that have, you know, have asked for the county commission to consider using the facility for other means like the cultural center or the justice center. So to my, my thought on this is if you wanted to consider that, it would, it would certainly you know, put the emphasis to the city and less emphasis to the county going forward with another facility, especially since we're adding a brand new facility in Punta Gorda that we have to maintain. And it's a larger facility it's requiring more staff. So and if you and if you would like me to bring this back rather than your discussion today as an agenda item, I'd be happy to do that as well. I see one head nod positive. Commissioner Constance. Have have we spoken to the city about it? Yes. And they would be receptive to taking it over and we would have no financial uh, request? Well, it depends upon who you ask. Oh boy. Uh, but I think that, I, again, it hasn't gone to their board, and that's kind of what I'm really asking for, is, is, that, is that something you all would accept if we, if we did that? Um, but I, the only position that I would have is that, that when we do that, that our responsibility is gone. Yeah. Um, Explore the, op the option, I guess. Go ahead. If I can continue. Um, I, I mean, I, I would hope they would be accepting because they're closer to the 
groups that are interested in utilizing the, the facility. And I think my position would be, you know, although it's a couple hundred thousand dollars, I mean, once the building goes down, the land is worth something, but that would be something that we're giving to the city. Um, and they're going to be maintaining that property and giving it to those folks in perpetuity. If that works out, that's great. My other, my other feeling is otherwise <coughs> sell it or knock the building down and then, you know, because that's, I, I've got to look at the least fiduciary responsibility to the taxpayers because you're exactly right. We're taking on this huge burden right around the corner and we have to maintain that and employ the people and keep the lights on and do all that other stuff. And, you know, we just aren't, we're not in, we're not designed to um, support nonprofits other than our contribution to United Way, and that's their their job is to you know put those monies out into the community as they see best. They've performed well in the past, and I think we're going to continue doing that. So that would be my direction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very good, Mr. Deutsch. Yeah, I think it makes sense. <clears throat> Either we sell it or we give it to the city, and and I think ultimately. Uh, there, I think we know there's about a half a dozen different groups that want to use it. Uh, and as I guess I've sort of mentioned it to a couple of city council members on one-on-ones, and they seem to have an interest in it. So but what we might want to do, Ray, is take, I think, the long-term benefit to the county as a whole might be greater by giving it to them and then having it used for a public purpose rather than selling it for a couple hundred grand or whatever we get to it. I don't know if there's any way you'd want to look at it and say, you know, which makes more sense. But I think, uh, and I th you've already mentioned it to Howard sort of informally, haven't you? And well, I, I, I think we should pursue it. Thank you. Very good. Mr. Truex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like us to, um, have that discussion on either giving it to the city of Punta Gorda or selling it. And I'd like to, um, if real estate services could give us an idea of what that value might be um, with the building as it is, without having to pay for demolition on it. That would be my, one of those two ways is what I'd be willing to do. <clears throat> Mr. Tisea. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, I'd like to. On this item. Oh, no, I'm good. Uh, and I'm, I'm on board, too. I think we should do it, right? Okay. Check it. So I'll bring it back as an agenda item so mm -hmm. we can get direction and we'll provide the information that Commissioner Truex just asked about. Very good. Okay, thank you. All set. Ms. Knowlton? I have nothing today. Very good. Okay, I'll go to Commissioner comments, starting with uh, Commissioner Truex. Yes, sir. Um, I do have something I want to pass out. Um, just to board's consideration to come back <coughs> your mic, sir, your mic. Sorry about that. I uh, just wanted to pass this out for everybody's consideration. This is um, a, a resolution that Palm Beach County is doing that uh, actually Terry Burroughs from Okeechobee County forwarded to me in reference to LACO uh, and uh, support, basically a resolution of support uh, in reference to some of the things that are going on with, with the dike. Um, and we don't have to sit here and read it right now, but I would like for you to take this back and then if um, I could ask Ray on his one-on-ones, if, because it needs to be crafted for Charlotte County. If there's support for this item, then I would ask permission at a meeting that we actually ask staff to put some time into it and move it forward. Very good. Thank you, sir. That's it. Mr. Constance. Um, I have one, one question, because I noticed that the um, letter we looked at today was, was written on the letterhead that has the new logo. Is that what legal is? When you send a letter out, you're using that letterhead, or are you using the seal letterhead? Um, we are following whatever the county policy is, and I believe it's on with the logo. I'll have to check, Commissioner. Okay, so, Mr. Chairman, I, I, to be quite honest, never, maybe it was in one-on-ones that somebody said, we're going to be looking at a new logo or doing that kind of thing, but before I knew it, we had a new logo on coasters and T-shirts and hats and letterhead and all this stuff. Um, and that may be a, a wise move because it lines up with tourism and it lines up with the logo for economic development. 
But at the end of the day, this is an official governmental entity, and that is our official seal behind us, and I've been, I've been promised that that's not going to go away and put that fruity thing up there. So my point is that when we're doing official business, I want the seal, and I would, I would like the policy of this board to be that anything that leaves the attorney's office is on the letterhead with the or seal. Our office. Or our office, letterhead with the seal, anything with administration, the letterhead with the seal. The other departments, if they see fit for doing it for economic development or tourism purposes, to use the new one. But honestly, we never really had this discussion. I don't even remember a workshop where, huh? Yeah. So I mean, I've just where we actually said we're pulling the trigger and going in this direction. So maybe I'm maybe I'm incorrect, but I'd like us to develop <coughs> our policy again on this. The letter we we're discussing this morning, however, will be going out on the on the letterhead that has the seal. Okay. Just to clarify that, Commissioner Deutsch. Yeah, I just want to comment because I had that discussion, and unless I misunderstood, I thought we were going to be keeping the seal for official stuff, and that just using the new thing with the flower on it or whatever, as you said. You well, know, up on the screen here. I mean, I guess I'm okay with it, even in the chambers. That's a, that's a, a good, positive, feel good. I don't mean to interrupt, but I mean it's that I get the idea for that, but for official business. The seal is we've not changed. I was seal. under the impression we were going to keep it and keep it on our business cards and keep it on our letterhead and all that, even on the vehicles. But you know, maybe maybe Ray can clarify that because I, I had a different impression too. Let's let's bring it back to where we can actually take action on it if, if you know formally if we need to, but Ray, you know, maybe the, the genesis of how it was created, refresh our memories and, and all that would be helpful. But I agree. I mean personally agree that all the official Stuff going out for the, from the BCC or the attorney's office or really the administrator's office should should be uh, on the letterhead. The fifth floor fifth floor should carry the seal and maybe the rest. I mean, I don't think I even mind having the new logo on the trucks. That's that's where we that's should. a that's a tourism. Yeah, I mean, I get that. Let's bring it back and kick it around. And make sure we get. Okay, that's that's all, I have, sir. Thank you. Very good. All set. Mr. Tissel, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, not to leave anything on the table from this morning, but uh, I did fail to make a motion to withdraw the bill. So if any of my colleagues would like to bring that up for reconsideration, I'd like the opportunity to make a motion to withdraw the bill. While I indicated that's what we needed to do, I never made a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good, sir. Anything else? You all set? Yes, sir. That's it. Mr. Deutsch. Happy birthday, Mr. Chairman. You don't look a day older than yesterday. The very best. Thank you very much, Commissioner. As far as I'm concerned, uh, we had uh, the meetings last week, a uh, good meeting in, in Tallahassee, the FAC Legislative Day. Uh, the Water Policy Committee got together. We actually met in the old historic uh, Senate chambers. It was really neat, the best, best way to describe it. it uh, the governor spoke for a few minutes, uh, had good uh, DEP secretary uh, presented to, uh, just a good kickoff meeting uh, relative to the water policy. The FAC is going to try to work, again, with the state, uh, that committee, to, to try to work th through all these issues. And it's, as you can imagine, very complex. I mean, the water policy is not only water quality issues, but water supply issues. And different places in the state have, have both. And uh, so it's going to be an interesting, uh, interesting exercise. Commissioner Truex and myself sit on that. Uh, Commissioner Constance, I think, by by Nate, the fact that you're the past president of FAC, you get to go whatever meeting you want to go to. Everywhere, it's great. So it's, 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 <laughs> there's always a place. So uh, there was some good discussion. Uh, there's a lot of work to do. And the, the goal, I would say, is to, from that kickoff meeting, was to get uh, sort of the, the bullet points of items that needed to be addressed at the annual meeting in June. Anything to add on that? Um, I have something else, because I, I okay. did want to discuss. That's all I had. Go ahead, sir. So I just wanted to talk about the, um, the WCIND meeting that we had last week. Um, very, very positive um, meeting. Uh, we actually signed a proclamation for Commissioner Deutsch for his six years of service. You, you're going to be getting it in a frame. I, spoiler alert. Um, but we, you know, we're really making some very good progress on getting on the right track with the derelict boats. And we've had kind of an 18-month hiccup because of the state law change. But I think now we're starting to get that, that fixed. Uh, one thing that I've asked uh, Justin McBride to do is since there are many occasions when that agenda is not ready for us, I've invited him to come to the meeting 
whenever it is, prior to, and just mm -hmm. say they're deg the agenda's not ready yet. However, these are the subjects we're going to be talking about. So he can give us a little briefing. It gives him some air time. I think it's important to talk about the issues that are out there. And he's up in Venice, so it's not a, he's very happy to do that. And we're going to start doing a pre-agenda here the Monday before the Thursday as well. So we're caught up. But I, you know, the, the other commissioners are, I mean, it's uh, Commissioner Hammond from Lee, uh, Commissioner Whitmore from uh, Manatee and, and Commissioner Hines from Sarasota, who who actually wasn't there this meeting, but it's a very good group. It's very collegial, and I really feel like we're going to get a lot of good work done. So that's a great idea. And, you know, it's been difficult. Portina will come to the podium, and there's nothing to report. Right, and I don't to look at you know yeah. it's just the way it was, the timing of these. So I, I approached the, the the subject with him, and he was m absolutely more than happy to to come and participate. Very good. Thank you. Okay, commissioners, we have uh, finished our comments. Uh, the only remaining thing is our land use uh, hearings, which cannot commence until 2 p.m. So as a result, we're going to recess until 2 p.m.
Bypass the crowds and discover a fun, fresh, and affordable Florida. This is the Gulf Coast destination where nature still rules the roost. No high rises here. It's all eco and visitor friendly. Welcome to Punta Gorda and Englewood Beach. Hi, I'm Casey. If you like to be around the water, then you've come to the right place. There are miles of pristine and uncrowded beaches on the islands in the Gulf. Great places to boat and fish in Lemon Bay and Gasparilla Sound, Mayaka River and Peace River. And Charlotte Harbor, rich with marine life. Water is a big part of our life here. Boating, fishing, snorkeling, kayaking, paddleboarding, not to mention the fabulous fresh seafood at all the great restaurants. There's plenty to do on land too. Tour a swamp, hold a gator, go birding or go for a birdie. There's a lot to enjoy in the great outdoors. And indoors too. Shops and spas, antiques and boutiques, galleries, museums. It can be good to go inside. Time to unwind? You'll find intimate bistros and symphonic concerts, live theater and comedy in every corner of the county. No matter where you are, it's easy to get here. The Punta Gorda Airport offers nonstop flights from over 20 destinations. Airports in nearby Sarasota, Fort Myers, Tampa, and St. Petersburg are served by most major airlines. Coming by car, US 41 and Interstate 75 bring you right to our doorstep. Among the first to get here were the Calusa, who populated the coastland of southwest Florida. The Spanish were the first Europeans to visit. They altered the name Calusa to Carlos and called the harbor Bahia Carlos or Carlos Bay. When the English came in the 1700s, they renamed the harbor Charlotte after King George III's wife. Charlotte Harbor is big. It's the second largest estuary in Florida covering approximately 270 square miles, 
From downtown Punta Gorda, it's about 22 miles to the Gulf of Mexico. The harbor's brackish waters, a mixture of salt and fresh water, create a near-perfect ecosystem for aquatic life. Most of the fish in the Gulf of Mexico began life in Charlotte Harbor. In fact, the waters here, the Peace and Mayaca Rivers, Charlotte Harbor, Gasparilla Sound, Lemon Bay, the Gulf, team with 256 species of fish. Snook, redfish, sea trout, yellowtail, cobia, snapper, shark, grouper, barracuda, kingfish, mackerel, you get the idea. Oh, and tarpon. Sport Fishing Magazine says the number one place in the world to catch tarpon is in these waters. Anglers can whisper glide into the mangroves on a kayak, surf cast along the beaches, cast from a pier or troll from a boat, hire a charter, fish in the harbor, the bay, or the gulf. Experienced guides will lead you to the best spots, bait your hooks, and clean the fish you catch. They'll even have your Florida fishing license, good for that trip, ready to go. If you're visiting and want to fish, non-resident licenses are easy to obtain. You can get them at bait and tackle stores, marinas, sporting good departments, online, and even over the phone. Go to myfwc.com for everything you need to know to get your license. What helps make the harbor a great place for fish is the undeveloped natural shoreline. In the 1970s, the state of Florida preserved most of the land and islands surrounding the harbor, making it the state's third largest park. Charlotte Harbor Preserve State Park covers 43,000 acres and more than 100 miles of shoreline. Most of the park is shallow water fringed by mangroves. The best access is by canoe or kayak. Paddling through the park is the best way to see wading birds, manatees, dolphins, and other wildlife. Hikers and bird watchers can explore wildlife along three marked trails. The preserve includes mangrove forests, marshes, scrub habitats, and pine flatwoods. The Charlotte Harbor Environmental Center, Czech, is a great place to learn more about the area. Their Alligator Creek Preserve location on Burnt Store Road has four miles of trails. Their second location at 115-acre Cedar Point Environmental Park is on Lemon Bay where bald eagles make their nests. Czech also offers wading tours of the harbor and Lemon Bay. A naturalist leads the tours. Armed with a net, you scoop marine life from the seafloor. You might find hermit crabs, seahorses, pipefish, and much more. Everything, of course, goes back into the water. You can find out more at checkflorida.org. Where's the perfect place to go wading? The beaches, of course, and the pristine waters of the Gulf of Mexico. There are 28 miles of gorgeous beaches in Charlotte County. The waters are beautiful shades of aquamarine. The beaches are on the barrier islands just off the mainland. Gasparilla Island, home to Boca Grande, is reachable by way of a toll bridge on Boca Grande Causeway. There are no bridges to Little Gasparilla and Don Pedro Islands, so a boat's the way to go. The state park on Don Pedro is particularly inviting. A beautiful pavilion with all the amenities overlooks an uncrowded beach on the Gulf of Mexico. One low fee gets you a ferry ride to the island in park admission. Knight or Palm Island has regular auto ferry and water taxi service. The beaches are open to the public, but be aware that unless you're a guest on the island, there are no facilities available. The beaches on Minnesota Key are easy to get to. Two toll-free bridges take you to Stump Pass Beach and Englewood Beach. Do the names Spiny Jewel Box, Moon Snail, Letter to Olive, and Cat's Paw mean anything to you? Those are just a few of the many types of seashells you'll find on our sandy white beaches. And shark teeth? There are no better beaches in the United States to find prehistoric fossilized shark teeth than right here. Do your shelling on the beach or in the water. The gulf waters off the islands here are mostly shallow, so you can usually wade or swim quite a ways out. If you'd like to get on the water, there are plenty of boats to rent or charter. Sailboats, fishing boats, pleasure boats, even jet skis. There are easily accessed public docks and marinas on Charlotte Harbor and Lemon Bay. Or let someone else do the driving. Take a nature cruise up the Peace River and you'll see lots of wildlife, including gators. For birds, the small river islands make perfect rookeries. From January through April, you could spot ospreys, wood storks, herons, roseate spoonbills, 
egrets, white pelicans, even eagles raising their newly hatched families. You can cruise to the barrier islands in the Gulf where you can have lunch or play on the beach. In December, explore the residential canals to see miles of elaborate holiday lighting displays. Or just cruise the harbor any evening to catch a spectacular Florida sunset. Rather go sailing? Sail Magazine ranks Charlotte Harbor as one of the top 10 places to sail in the United States. Charter a sailboat or bring your own. Even experience one of several regattas held throughout the year. Go to PeerFlorida.com to find out more about regattas and where to charter sailboats. If you'd like to see the harbor or the gulf, but prefer to stay dry, there are several miles of pathways around the county perfect for a bicycle. The Cape Hayes Pioneer Trail is on an old railroad line that led to Boca Grande. The 8.5 mile trail starts near the intersection of South McCall and Gasparilla Roads and runs to the Boca Grande Causeway. Once you're on Gasparilla Island, you can take the 6.5 mile Boca Grande Trail. Didn't bring your bike? That's okay. Punta Gorda has a free bicycle loaner program. There are multiple points along the harbor's edge where you can borrow a bike, complete with helmet, and go exploring. Last year, the program provided bikes to over 5,000 riders from 43 states and 15 countries. And did I mention that it's free? Punta Gorda is a very bicycle-friendly community. Designated trails will take you not only along the waterfront, but to some other great points of interest. Nature is on full display at Babcock Webb. Located just a quarter mile off Interstate 75 at exit 158, the area covers more than 65,000 acres of wildlife habitats. There are pine flatwoods, wet and dry prairies, and saltwater marshes. You can explore Babcock Webb by bicycle, by car, or on foot. However you travel, you'll likely see plenty of wildlife. Over 300 different species of birds can be found in Charlotte County. Red-shouldered hawks, woodpeckers, ospreys, eagles, and egrets. Sandhill cranes, herons, and ibis. Pelicans and cormorants. If you enjoy your feathered friends, you'll find they are flocking here. You can spot these birds on your own at the parks and preserves throughout the county or on the beaches. Plus, the Peace River Audubon Society invites you to join them on a morning walkabout. Want a guaranteed way to see a lot of birds? Visit the Peace River Wildlife Center in Ponce de Leon Park. Here, they treat over 2,000 injured, ill, or orphaned animals, mostly birds, every year. Animals that can't return to the wild find a home here. The star attractions include Luna, a very rare white screech owl. Lions, tigers, and bears, oh my! Need help sometimes as well. The Octagon Wildlife Sanctuary, southeast of downtown Punta Gorda, is dedicated to the rescue of abused and abandoned exotic wildlife. None of these animals has been taken from the wild. They've all come from abused, injured, or unwanted situations. Some residents are on the threatened or endangered list. It's fun to see the sights, but maybe you're a doer, not a viewer. Then Southwest Florida's newest attraction, Florida Tracks and Trails, is for you. This thousand-acre complex has four motocross tracks, a side-by-side -side track, and a mud zone. There are over 22 miles of ATV trails and more than 80 acres of custom-designed paintball and speedball fields. Add a freshwater beach with acres of pure white sand to complete your outdoor adventure. There's more off-roading down the road a bit. The Gone Country Motor Sports Park has more than 800 acres of mud, hills, and track to test even the toughest machine. Closer to town in Carmelita Park is Charlotte BMX. This premier BMX racing facility recently hosted the Sunshine State Nationals. You can go watch some races or rent the track and give it a go yourself. Perhaps your idea of the perfect outdoor adventure involves hitting a small white dimpled ball into a hole. You've come to the right place. Golf Digest rated our area as one of the top three places in the U.S. to live and play golf. In fact, there's great golf throughout the county. Both 18 and 27 hole courses, all beautifully landscaped, all open to the public, can be found here. Even miniature golf, right on the harbor. Not only is Charlotte County one of the best places to play golf, it's also the best place to see Major League Spring Training Baseball. That's right. In a poll of USA Today readers, Charlotte Sports Park, spring training home for the Tampa Bay Rays, was voted the best spring training facility in the U.S. During the regular season, you can enjoy the Charlotte Stone Crabs, a high-A minor league affiliate of the Rays. But wait, there's more. 
Up-and-coming college stars play here in the annual Snowbird Baseball Classic, drawing top college teams from around the country. Tennis or pickleball, anyone? There are plenty of public courts. Gilchrist Park in Panagorda has both tennis and pickleball courts, with the harbor as a stunning backdrop. Port Charlotte Beach Park also has a beautiful harbor view with tennis and basketball courts, volleyball, and bocce ball. Want more parks? You're not far from a park wherever you are. You'll find beautifully landscaped parks, many with boat ramps, fishing piers, playgrounds, athletic courts and fields, picnic benches and shelters, even beaches. At Lashley Park in Punta Gorda, kids can romp and play in the fountains. At the water's edge, you'll find the Spirit of Punta Gorda Memorial Statue. Made of steel and hurricane debris, it's dedicated to the community's determination and fortitude after Hurricane Charlie struck. The town has actually been leveled twice. Hurricane Charlie, of course, in 2004. But devastation struck almost 100 years earlier when a fire destroyed most of the city in 1905. Both times, the town bounced back stronger than before. About two and a half miles west of downtown Punta Gorda is Ponce de Leon Park. The park is nicely situated on the harbor with a boat ramp, fishing pier, raised boardwalks through the mangroves, and a man-made beach. This is where, according to legend, the Spanish explorer was felled by a Calusa poison arrow in 1521. Ponce made history here some 500 years ago, but the history of Punta Gorda is relatively recent. The town, which started as a fishing village, was founded in 1884 by Colonel Isaac Tribu and called Tribu. In 1887, the name was changed to Punta Gorda, Spanish for Fat Point. The history of the city is depicted in a series of murals throughout town, some as large as 48 feet wide and 33 feet high. More than two dozen murals portray everything from the first city council to the animals and marine life that reside here. You can find an interactive map of the mural locations online at puntagordamurals.org or find Punta Gorda Mural Society on Facebook. You can also touch and feel the history here, starting with History Park on Shreve Street, not far from downtown. Several original buildings have been relocated to these beautifully landscaped grounds, including the Trabu office building, the oldest remaining structure in Charlotte County. The western roots of Englewood. In 1884, three brothers came here to grow lemons, and the nearby intercoastal waterway got named Lemon Bay. You'll need six bucks to cross the toll bridge to Gasparilla Island in the village of Boca Grande, but it's money well spent. As the Chamber of Commerce puts it, this is the secret island that presidents and celebrities sneak away to. The centerpiece of the island is historic Boca Grande, Big Mouth in Spanish. Boca Grande Pass is the mouth of Charlotte Harbor. No gas stations, chain restaurants, nor billboards found here. Just unique shops, galleries, and restaurants in an idyllic tropical setting. The Gulf Coast of Southwest Florida has been drawing tourists since Ponce de Leon came ashore. But things really popped after World War II when developers spread the word. A house in the sun for any size pocketbook. And that jump-started Port Charlotte. An average January high temperature of 75 degrees didn't hurt either. The African-American heritage of Southwest Florida is recalled through exhibits and artifacts at the Blanchard House Museum, just a few blocks east of downtown. The museum is located in the four-room wood frame house built in 1925 for fisherman Joseph Blanchard. Segregated waiting rooms were the norm in train stations of the early 20th century, and the Punta Gorda train depot was no exception. Built in 1928, it was the southernmost train depot in the U.S. at the time. The segregated waiting room is now a museum presenting the history and culture of African Americans in Charlotte County. The freight room is now a popular antique mall. Our military history is on display at the Military Heritage Museum in Fisherman's Village. Thousands of artifacts display the history of conflicts dating to the Spanish-American War. All branches of the service are represented. Now, shift gears for a different kind of museum, Muscle Car City. Located on Tamiami Trail on the south side of Punta Gorda, this place is a car lover's dream. Over 200 vintage muscle cars. There are classic cars and hot rods spanning 35 years of makes and models all under one roof. Vintage stuff here isn't just in museums, it's for sale. Antique malls, flea markets, thrift store, consignment shops, great stuff, 
and deals are everywhere. Whether it's clothing or collectibles, fishing lures or furniture, tools or jewels, you'll find high quality merchandise. Like my outfit? Seven bucks. Take the time to explore for the bargains. There are around 60 thrift and consignment shops in the area. If the shopper in you yearns for more, you're in luck. There are a number of retail stores throughout the county, plenty for even the most dedicated shopper. Port Charlotte Town Center in the heart of Charlotte County has five anchor stores plus more than 100 other shops and restaurants. Fisherman's Village has 40 specialty shops on a covered pier in Charlotte Harbor. Downtown Punta Gorda has an interesting blend of stores and boutiques. Shop for that perfect souvenir on Minnesota Key or your soon-to-be favorite t-shirt in Placida. Find fun and funky things in the shops and galleries on Dearborn Street in Englewood. And check out five acres of pottery, bamboo, and tropical plants at Pottery Express at the southern edge of Charlotte County. Speaking of Placida, this little fishing village is a great place to get fresh seafood, but now the main attractions are the galleries each filled with original artwork in a variety of mediums. Frequent festivals bring dozens more artists to show and sell their work. In fact, art and craft shows abound throughout the area. Some draw artists from all over the country. They fill parks and streets are blocked off, attracting thousands of people. As in Placida, there are lots of year-round galleries in the area. Quite a few are found in Punta Gorda, including the working studios and galleries in the Atelier. You can find more galleries downtown, at Fisherman's Village, and at other locations around the city. And check out the bicycle art here too. Are you interested in not only viewing art, but learning how to create your own? Visual art centers in both Punta Gorda and Englewood have interesting galleries, and they provide classes for aspiring artists in an array of medium. Jewelry making, drawing, painting, pottery, you can do it all here. Artists are even on display at the farmer's markets. During the height of the season, you'll find farmer's markets offering the freshest fruits and vegetables, baked goods, cheeses, jams and jellies, seafood, even exotic plants, soaps, candles and jewelry. There are markets in Englewood, Boga Grand, and two in Punta Gorda, Saturdays downtown and Sundays at the History Park. The downtown farmer's market has been voted best in Florida and one of the top 15 in the United States. Farmer's markets are great for fresh food, but if you'd like to get yours already cooked, well, have we got the restaurants for you. There are great one-of-a-kind restaurants throughout the county. In Punta Gorda alone, there are over 50 independently owned restaurants. Even the best ice cream shop in the United States, according to TripAdvisor. Plus, there's lots of outside dining and waterfront dining. What do you get when you cross Charlotte Harbor with the Gulf of Mexico? Fabulous seafood restaurants. That's what you get. Pick the ambiance that suits your mood. From upscale elegant to funky waterfront. From sports bar to brew pub. Irish pub and English pub. Yes, you can get bangers and mash here. And why not get a side order of live music with your meal? Food and music are even part of the two biggest festivals in Punta Gorda. The Wine and Jazz Festival in the winter and the Blues, Brews and Barbecue Festival in the summer. You can bring out your musical mood every Sunday night with the Drum Circle on Englewood Beach Year-round, you can enjoy music festivals and concerts at a host of venues, or see nationally known comedians at a restaurant comedy club. There are two multi-purpose event centers. Englewood Event Center is close to the beaches. Charlotte Harbor Event Center is right on the harbor. Both offer concerts, theater, and dinner theater, comedy, and special events. The Cultural Center of Charlotte County has a 500-seat theater with perfect views to the stage. Catch a concert here or live theater featuring the Charlotte Players. The Players also perform at the Langdon, a small black box theater near the Town Center Mall. In 2003, the county partnered with the school district and the city of Punta Gorda to open the Charlotte Performing Arts Center. This spectacular 900-seat theater is home to the Charlotte Chorale, the Charlotte Symphony Orchestra, and the Gulf Shore Opera. So, great nightlife? Check. Fabulous restaurants? Check. Beautiful beaches? Check. Super boating and fishing? Check. Terrifical tropical weather? Check. Fun things to see and do? Check, check, and mate. Call it your favorite getaway. Call it your home away from home. Call it your best vacation ever. Or just call it what we do, paradise.
I'm Elizabeth Tracy with CCTV News You Can Use. We're here today at CARE, the Center for Abuse Rape Emergencies, to learn how we can stop violence one interaction at a time. Let's go inside to talk to Chris Hall about the Green Dot Program. Hi, Chris. I wanted to come by and talk to you about the Green Dot Program. Sure, thank you for coming. Tell me what Charlotte County Green Dot Program is. So the Charlotte County Green Dot Program is all about changing our culture. It's a program that's designed to encourage our community to become active rather than passive bystanders so that when you're faced with situations where maybe something could become a violent moment, we give you the, the tools and the equipment that you need to hopefully step in and prevent that from becoming an actual instance of violence. Let's talk a little bit about what the training is. What, what are you taught? So the idea behind the training is about what we call active bystander intervention, and we're targeting six different forms of violence. And when we say violence, we're talking about power-based personal violence specifically, which includes domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, bullying, child abuse, and elder abuse. And the idea is that if we can teach these community members, if you're coming across a situation that looks like there might be a problem or something that just kind of gets your gut, um, we want you to be able to do something about it that's safe and realistic. I see a little green dot on your shirt. What is that? So that is the, the symbol that we wear. Anybody who's come through one of our trainings gets one of these green dot lapel pins. And the idea is that somebody somewhere hopefully will come up to you and say, exactly as you just did, what's with that green dot? And that's your opportunity to say, I'm glad you asked. This is what it's all about. And it just represents my stance against power-based personal violence. When is the training? How do they sign up? For mm -hmm. So the trainings are kind of scheduled um, as interest swells. And the idea is that the more people we get that reach out to us and say, hey, I'd be interested in attending one of those trainings, um, I just kind of jot their names down. I get like a list together. And then when we get about 25 or 30 people, I'll schedule a training. And I usually try to do them all over the county. Recently, Hall gave Green Dot training to members of the Charlotte County Community Services department. You know, we talked about domestic violence before and we've added dating violence to that. How many people have been trained through this program? Uh, about 500. About 500 people have been through our, our trainings through our first three program years and of course we're not done yet. Understand that you might have a connection to either the target or the person committing the, the at-risk behavior. What would you like the citizens of Charlotte County to know about Green Dot? I would tell you that this program is for anyone. Um, it doesn't matter how old or how young or anything of that nature. What we want is for the entire community in a perfect world, every single member of Charlotte County would come through one of these trainings. And it's just the idea of we're all in this together and we can do something to help each other out without putting ourselves in a bad situation at the same time. Charlotte County Green Dot uses statistics from the UCR or Universal Crime Report from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. With this report, they can track how much violence is going on and they hope with enough people trained, those numbers will decrease. Hall shared with us some recent numbers for the county. For example, if we talked about domestic violence in 2017, the most recent statistics we have, Charlotte County law enforcement just here in Charlotte County responded to 619 different domestic violence calls. The scary part about that is how many of those calls never got made. The Green Dot training, according to Hall, is so effective, he talked to us about some of his personal experiences he had at the beach one day. Um, I was at Clearwater Beach one time, just kind of walking around with my wife, and we were shopping and stuff, and there was a little girl who was maybe three, four years old, um, and she was running towards, not me specifically, but my direction, and she had fear in her eyes, and you know fear in a child's eyes. You can't mistake that look. So I said, okay, something bad is happening here, and I start to go through my process. And then I hear her mother chasing after her, and her mother says, for the world to hear, I'm going to show you how it feels to kick somebody. And so now as a parent myself, I know that moment of frustration and how kids can get you to that, oh my goodness, what am I going to do point. But I said, I'm not going to sit back and watch this mother kick this little girl. So my options are, I go through my, what we call the three Ds, which we mentioned, the direct approach. I can walk up to this mother and I can tell her that I disagree with her parenting style, which is not a good option for me. Um, the second option is the delegate approach, but as I said, this was happening right now, there's no time. So I can't refer this to another person, so I went with the distraction. So what I did was, as the little girl ran past me, I kind of got in front of the mom, and I just said, excuse me, do you know where I can buy a hat? The sun is killing me. That's all I said, four seconds of my life. But in the four seconds, the little girl made it to her father who was behind me, which is why she was running this way, and dad picked her up and started to give her a lecture. And I said, wow, that's really cool that I just prevented this girl from getting kicked. Instead, she got a little bit of a lecture from her dad. I'd rather get lectured than kicked. So just a, a moment that 
it was an aha moment for me to see what I had learned and to actually use it and see that it, it can be done. And if you would like to know more about the Charlotte County Green Dot program, you can find them on Facebook at Green Dot Charlotte County or on their website at carefl.org forward slash green dot. For CCTV News You Can Use, I'm Elizabeth Tracy. Good afternoon and welcome back to the uh, board meeting of April 9th, 2019. We're at the 2 p.m. land use public hearing portion of our agenda. First item, oh, first, uh, there is a quasi-judicial item. Uh, if anyone plans on giving testimony to the board, please rise to be sworn. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please say, I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you very much. First item is legislative. It's uh, Petition uh, STN-19-00001. Mr. Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Stephen Ellis, Community Development. This is a street name change. There you see it's in uh, the middle of ter the Term Bay development. Oh, new name. Which is being renamed. The future land use designation is DRI Mixed Use. And the zoning designation is PD, Plan Development. This would be the result of the proposed change. Lennar Homes LLC is requesting a street name change for all of Turn Bay Boulevard, changing it to Heritage Landing Boulevard. It's located east of the Peace River, north and west of Burnt Store Road, and south of the city of Punta Gorda in Commission District 2. The subject street is 23.85 acres, more or less, located in Turn Bay Golf and Country Club Resort subdivision, as recorded in Plat Book 19, pages 18A through 18M. The applicant has requested that the street name for the reference segment of Turn Bay Boulevard be changed to Heritage Landing Boulevard to reflect the new name of the residential development. The renaming of this segment of Turn Bay Boulevard will be in compliance with Florida Statute 336.05. Uh, the agent for the applicant is present. Community Development recommends approval of petition STN 19-00001. Be happy to take your questions. Commissioners, any questions for Mr. Ellis? Seeing no one, the applicant. Good afternoon, Rob Bernson, Big W Law Firm. <clears throat> As you can see, um, this is the only area that's currently platted within 
uh, the existing Turn Bay, which is going to become Heritage Landing. That's what they're marketing it as. We are in the process of submitting an NOPC. We've been working with the staff uh, to kind of bring the DRI up to uh, current rules and regulations and development. Uh, the project has been around for many, many years. It changed originally from Caliente Springs to Turn Bay in the turn of the century, kind of sat vacant from the uh, mid-2000s to recent. Lennar purchased the entire project and is moving forward with the development. There's active work going on with the uh, re rehabilitation of the golf courses out there. Uh, nobody actually lives on or has an address of Heritage Land or Turn Bay Boulevard. All of the streets come off of that, so this wouldn't affect anybody, and our future plats would use the Heritage Landing Boulevard to extend the road in the future. We respectfully request your approval of this change. Thank you. Thank you sir. Any questions from the applicant? Seeing none, I'll open up the public hearing. This is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to address the board on this petition, STN-19-00001, please step forward, sign and state your name for the record. You'll have five minutes. Again, this is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to address the board on this item, please step forward, sign and state your name for the record. You'll have five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I see no one rising. I move to close the public hearing. Motion set. Close the public hearing. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Hearing not passes unanimously. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Move approval. Second. Motion second to approve the resolution concerning this petition. Any discussion? I just guess I'm curious why they didn't go from Turn Bay to Scrub J Bay. I thought that's catchier. But thank you. <coughs> that on advice. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Appreciate that. Any additional discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say no. You know, it passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next item is quasi-judicial. It's petition FP-16-09-05, ex parte communications. Commissioner Truex. No, sir. Nothing? Commissioner Constance? Nothing, Mr. Chairman. I'll be hearing all of evidence for the first time. I did have my uh, monthly staff meeting, and I filed the paperwork this morning. Commissioner Paseo? Staff meetings filed paperwork. Thank you, sir. Staff Commissioner. filed. Very good. Oh. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. I did have a staff meeting. I will double check that Diane's filed the paperwork. Very good. I did. Thank you. Forgot. Mr. Ellis, go Thank ahead, you, Mr. Sir. Chairman, Stephen Ellis, Community Development. As this is quasi-judicial, I need to ask the board's acceptance as an expert in planning. Yes, sir. My credentials are attached to the staff report. Yes, sir. The applicant? No objection. Very good. Continue, this, sir. Thank you, sir. This is FP 160905. It's a request for final plat approval. You see the location is down near the border of the uh, city of Punta Gorda. And there's a close-up view of the development. The future land use designation is medium density residential, I'm sorry, low density residential. And the zoning designation is residential single family 3.5. This would be the results of the proposed change. Vasco PGF Development LLC is requesting final plat approval for a subdivision to be named Windward Isles consisting of 24 residential lots on 7.3 acres more or less. They are also requesting approval of a developer's agreement and surety to secure the completion costs of the plat infrastructure. The site is located south of Rio Villa Drive, north of Alligator Creek, east of Palm Drive and west of Windmill Boulevard in Commission District 2. This plat received preliminary plat approval on December 13, 2016. The applicant has provided a developer's agreement and surety in the amount of $1,081,645.95 from Star Financial Bank to cover the cost of the completion of the plat infrastructure. The county engineer has found the project to be in substantial compliance with previously approved plans. All the required signatures have been applied to the plat mylar. Uh, community development recommends approval of petition FP 160905. The agent for the applicant is present. We'll be happy to take your questions. Mr. Deutsch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve, we're looking down from the top down from Rio Villa. If the second lot seems oversized, 
the second and third lot look like they might be a little undersized. And according to what we're looking at, and I didn't pick up on this when I looked at it before, there's a donut hole there. Could you explain the three that seem to be a little irregular uh, out of those <coughs> second, third, fourth lot and the donut hole? Yes, sir. For the detail on this, I'll have to de defer to the applicant, but I can tell you there were some wetlands at the north end of the property. I believe there was also a special exception in play there. But again, I'll defer to the agent for the specifics on it. Okay. And uh, do you see the lots I'm, I'm talking about? Um, Commissioner Deutsch, if you don't mind, if, see if any other commissioner has any questions for, for staff. If not, I'll, I'll ask the applicant to come forward. Okay. Then, if you could address this question. Thank you. Yeah, the donut hole looks curious. Yeah. Um, very quickly, Jerry Waxler with the Macquarie Law Firm representing Vasco PGF Development, which is requesting final plat for its 24 lot canal front subdivision. This is an infill parcel. Uh, construction of the plat infrastructure has already begun. Uh, we actually already have one home and home site that has been reserved, obviously not under contract, not yet sold because it's not platted, but has been reserved. The developer's agreement, the surety, and the restrictive covenants have all been provided to the county. We concur in staff's analysis. What you see, um, Mr. Ellis was correct. Lot 24 is odd, or the, the second lot down is very is oddly shaped because they're actually behind it is a significant wetland area that is an easement over the lot. We put all of that into one area, and therefore you're seeing kind of the, the lot lines actually look a little I think are actually a little different than that I think you're showing some of the the easements there is no donut hole that I'm aware of um, but you do have wetlands back there and we have easements and things that that go up in an odd angle to be able to give all the lots access so to the canal do you have a lot there that's not going to be built on it's going to be just the only lot that is not buildable is the one at the very north and that's not that's not so much a lot as a common area it's tracked. So the, the lot to the very at the very north is tract A. That is a common area. Steve, could you throw up the topo for one second? I think you could see the wetlands in it. Maybe that makes it that sort of. It's a it's a filtration marsh. Yeah, see it? All right, that's and that's wet. Because you have a dead end canal, it, it's wet and it's a filtration marsh. It's actually a stormwater area that's being created so that you can get that filltration in that much. dead end canal. Thank you. All set, sir. Very good. Any other questions for the applicant? Or open the public hearing. Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to open up the public hearing. Anyone wishing to address the board on petition FP-16-09-05, please step forward, sign in, state your name for the record. You'll have five minutes. Again, this is a public hearing concerning petition FP-16-09-05. Wish to address the board, please step forward, sign in, state your name. For the record, you'll have five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I see no one rising. I move to close the public hearing. I'll second, second that. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Hearing none, passes unanimously. What's your pleasure, gentlemen? So I have a quick question then. Okay. Uh, I, I am looking at both the plat and an aerial view. So does that first lot not have access to the water at all? Is that basically the, the situation? And then lot two and three, they've moved their I mean, not that it matters, but I'm just, because it doesn't look like you can get to. The northernmost lot is not, is a tract. It, it houses um, a utility lift station, the signage. It's not listed as a, as a lot. It says tract A when you look at the northernmost. The lot lines, what you're not seeing is the, in this case, I the, see what um, you're saying. the it canal does. itself is part of the lots. So all the lots look very large. They actually have the canal that runs through them, the plat that, that is part of the platted lots, but there's an easement over the canal, an easement over the wetland, the, the filtration marsh. So the actual buildable area of the lots is more consistent with the size of the lots that you see across the street. No, I understand that. And and so track day, I get that is just a sort of a the keystone marker. Um, it's a common there. element in the yeah. subdivision. And then each of those houses, because you've skewed the first two or three as far as we'll have access to water. Every lot has access to right. the water, yes, sir. So there's enough room to put a dock or, yeah? On every lot, yes. Okay, thank you. Pleasure, gentlemen. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second to approve the final plat and developer's agreement for petition FP-16-09-05. Is there any discussion? 
Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say no. Hearing none, it passes unanimously. Thank you. Next, petition PV-19-01-01. Again, that's legislative. Mr. Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, Stephen Ellis, Community Development. This is PP-19-0101. It is plat vacation. You see that this is on 41 in the Punta Gorda area. And there's a close-up of the site. The future land use districts include, uh, is lo sorry, I have the wrong report. The future land use uh, designations include commercial, low density residential, and park <coughs> recreation. <coughs> and the zoning districts include commercial general, residential multifamily five, and parks and recreation. This would be the results of the proposed change if approved. PGBK Properties LLC is requesting to vacate a portion of the amended plat of South Punta Gorda Heights and its first edition, including a one block segment of St. Pierre Road, a total of 11.77 acres, more or less, as recorded in plat book five, pages 17A through 17C. It's located south and west of U.S. Highway 41, north of First Avenue and east of Payne Street in Commission District 2. The applicant owns lots 32B through 41B, lots 60, 1662 through 1670, 1677 through 1688, and track B, P14 abutting the northwest side of St. Pierre Road and lots 42B, 43B, and lots 1689 through 1705 abutting the southeast side. If the plat vacation is approved, the applicant will receive the entire width of the vacated right-of-way, and all the lot lines on the abutting lots will be removed. The applicant's stated purpose is to erase the platted lots and right-of-way to unify the existing property into a single parcel. As with all plat vacations, the applicant is not required to declare any future development plans for this site. The neighborhood the applicant's property backs up to is very sparsely populated, with most of the platted lots being undersized by current development standards in the county code. Of the 24 residential lots fronting First Avenue across from the applicant's property, all but two appear to be vacant lots. The targeted segment of St. Pierre Road provides a T-intersection access to U.S. Highway 41 with the ability to go north or south, but there is no connecting street on the opposite side. The next closest access to U.S. Highway 41 is Payne Street, approximately 0.3 miles to the north, that's a four-way intersection, or Notre Dame Boulevard, approximately 0.35 miles to the south, another T-intersection. This action would be consistent with a similar street vacation approved by the Board of County Commissioners in 2017, a little less than a mile south of this location. In that vacation, the closest alternate access points to US Highway 41 were 0.35 and 0.28 miles away, respectively. By way of comparison, the distance from the center of the intersection of US Highway 41 and Murdoch Circle to the center of the intersection of Murdoch Circle and Education Way is 0.34 miles. It is staff's position that no residents will be denied reasonable access to their property as a result of vacating this segment of St. Pierre Road. Current information on the property appraiser's account for lots 35B through 41B lists an office shop built in 1957 and a manufacturing plant built in 2004. The account for lots 42B through 43B shows an office warehouse built in 2002. And on lots 1662 and 1663, there's also a single family residence built in 1968. The dedication on the subject plat recorded in 1954 shows all the streets were dedicated to the public. 
All the affected utilities have been notified. CenturyLink has requested a utility easement for their multiple facilities within the targeted segment of St. Pierre Road. The applicant also has the option of paying to have those facilities relocated. All the pertinent departments have reviewed, resulting in a total of the single condition of the easement. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Board heard the petition on March 11, 2019 and forwarded it to the Board of County Commissioners with a recommendation of approval by a unanimous vote. Therefore, Community Development recommends approval of petition PV 190101 with the single condition previously mentioned. The agent for the applicant is present. We'll be happy to take your questions. Commissioners, any questions for Mr. Ellis? Seeing none, applicant. Good afternoon again. Jerry Waxler, Mercury Law Firm, this time representing PGBK Properties, PGBK Properties LLC, which is requesting a plat vacation. Over the course of the last three years, PGBK has been patiently and systematically acquiring the parcels and lots that make up this request. Um, you see the, the finger to the southernmost portion of the front, that finger of lots. They additionally own the large track just above it. That is not part of plat. That track was never platted, so it's not part of this request, but I want you to understand that they own that piece as well. The process of acquiring all these lots has included working through the bankruptcy courts to get approval to purchase the abandoned commercial properties that are north and south of St. Pierre Road, negotiating and completing a land swap with Charlotte County to acquire the thin rectangular shaped park strip between the commercial and residential portions of the property in return for giving the county east-west access to both First Avenue and Tamiami Trail, and convincing many individual lot owners to sell their undersized platted lots <coughs> along First Avenue. PGBK has done what our planners and our comprehensive plan has been encouraging for years. They have assembled properties from many and varied owners with the purpose of creating a large development tract. The next step is for Charlotte County to create that unified development tract by vacating the platted portions to eliminate lot lines and park strips and to also eliminate the street that bisects the property, St. Pierre Road. The vacation of St. Pierre Road still leaves multiple access points onto Notre Dame Boulevard and US 41, but eliminates the ability of traffic to cut through a residential neighborhood to reach US 41. PGBK acknowledges that CenturyLink has facilities within the right of way and accepts the condition to provide an easement or to relocate those facilities to accommodate their needs. Most importantly, this plat vacation creates one large tract of sufficient size and depth to accommodate buildings, stormwater management, parking, and landscape buffers to shield the residential properties that are uh, across First Avenue from it, and that small tract that we have not been able to acquire that does have homes as well. All of those things will be incorporated into PGBK's next step, which will be to present a concept plan as part of an application to rezone the site to plan development. We've begun working on that, but we haven't had, um, PGBK hasn't identified the exact uses that it wants yet, so we're still working on that, that plan, but that will be the next step. Staff has, rec has reviewed the request. It is recommending approval. The Planning and Zoning Board likewise recommended approval, and we request that the Board of County Commissioners approve this plot vacation. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions for the applicant? Commissioner Constance? Um, well, you know, I, I guess I'm understanding everything that you said, but um, I, I do disagree with you on the fact that you're going to have less access to 41, and I'm just trying to understand why it's something that we have to do, and the answer is we don't have to do it. And using the, uh, I think it's Tucker uh, uh, Trucking, or whatever that is, the um, Young Trucking, down south of, of Tucker's grade. The big reason that I voted for that was because that was access across the railroad track. And that was kind of a, a dangerous situation. So we decided that it was best to shut that off and not have those railroad crossings are costing us big time. So, you know, I, using that as a precedent, Mr. Ellis, is not, in my opinion, apples to apples. So I just, I have a real problem with this one, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Well, Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Um, the I think it's six lots that are 
Uh, they have not been able to acquire. You say they are going to continue to try to acquire those? They, they have had some discussion with them. Um, they're very far apart on price. I think it is unlikely. So we recognize that we will have to provide a significant buffer around those lots to protect that, those residences. What? I don't think I had the same concerns as deep as yours, but I did have concerns about shutting down that road. Um, in, in looking at the proximity of other roads, I, and I think about some of the comments we had today about Fruitland and creating, <laughs> creating other traffic issues, I see that there's not many houses in there right now. Um, and I don't know that that would create the same kind of a problem. Have we looked at that from a traffic perspective? The traffic engineer was... Saw no issues, right? That's what I thought I read. Got no comments back from it. All right. Um, Hmm. Okay. I don't have any other questions. Very good. I, I think, quite honestly, the uh, the next step in the process, uh, when the PD is put together, have a better understanding of what the real intent is. That's going to help us a lot with understanding what the proposed access internally will be, and externally. I believe. Any no other questions for the applicant? I will open up the public hearing. This is a public hearing concerning petition PV-19-01-01. Anyone wishing to address the board, please step forward, sign in, state your name for the record. You'll have five minutes. Again, this is a public hearing concerning petition PV-19-01-01. If you wish to address the board on this item, please step forward, sign in, state your name for the record. You'll have five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I see no one rising. I move to close the public hearing. Second. Motion to second. Close the public hearing. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those say no. Hearing none, it passes unanimously. What's your pleasure, gentlemen? Uh, Mr. Chairman, point of information. Your comment, though, was once that the, the PD is, is more defined, you'll have a better idea. But you, once you vacate this, you're vacated it. You can't get it back. I agree. Okay. But we, we get, we get the, to see what the next step would be. And I guess I'm comfortable with that, with the staff recommendation, with P&Z's recommendation, that we, and we get to see the PD. That, that's the good part. We get to vote on that. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes, I'm, sir. Um, I, I know that area a little, a little bit, probably not as well as I'd like to, but um, I would say that the, the acquisition and the, and the combination of putting things, these things together is certainly going to be a benefit to the community, um, a great improvement over what we've been seeing there for years. And um, though I, I have some reservation about that access point, I think there's access points close um, each direction that it will not create a hardship for the community. And I would move approval of the resolution. And I'll second that. <clears throat> Any discussion? And again, yeah, I agree with that comment about helping the, I used to actually, Nancy and I used to live across the street in the mobile home section back more years than I'm going to admit to. And, uh, and yeah, this would be a significant improvement to that area down there. Any, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say no. No. Let the record show the motion passes four to one with Commissioner Constance dissenting. That's it. Commissioners, I think we've completed all of our agenda items for the day. Ms. Nolton, do you concur? Yes. As a result, this meeting is adjourned.